Okay, my name is Bill Anderson. This is uh, from Schoolhouse Productions in Rockport, Maine. Three re uh, readings from P.D. Ospensky's In Search of the Miraculous. The uh, book begins that I had returned to Russia in November 1914, the beginning of the First World War, after a rather long journey through Egypt, Ceylon, and India. The war had found me in Colombo, and from there I went back through England. When uh, leaving Peterburg, Petersburg at the start of my journey, I had said that I was going to seek the miraculous. The miraculous was a, is very difficult to define, but for me this word had quite a definite meaning. I had come to the conclusion a long time ago that there was no escape from the labyrinth of contradictions in which we live except by an entirely new road, unlike anything hitherto known or used by us. But where this new or forgotten road began, I was unable to say. I already knew then as an undoubted fact that beyond the thin film of false reality there existed another reality from which, for some reason, something separated us. The miraculous was a penetration into this unknown reality. Now, from this first chapter I just wanted to read three, three uh, of the dialogues that uh, Ospensky relates in his conversations with uh, a man named G. Once I, was, uh, once I was talking with G in Moscow, I was speaking about London, where I had been staying a short while before about the terrifying mechanization that was being developed in big European cities and without which it was probably impossible to live and work in those immense whirling mechanical toys. People are turning into machines, I said, and no doubt sometimes they become perfect machines, but I do not believe they can think. If they tried to think, they could not have been such fine machines. Yes, said G, that is true, but only partly true. It depends first of all on the question which mind they use for their work. If they use the proper mind, they will be able to think even better in the midst of all their work with machines. But again, it, only if they think with a proper mind. I did not understand what G meant by proper mind and understood it only much later. And secondly, he continued, the mechanization you speak of is not at all dangerous. A man may be a man, he emphasized this word, while working with machines. There is another kind of mechanization which is much more dangerous, being a machine oneself. Have you ever thought about the fact that all peoples themselves are machines? Yes, I said. From the strictly scientific point of view, all people are machines governed by external influences. But the question is, can the scientific point of view be wholly accepted? Scientific or not scientific is all the same to me, said G. I want you to understand what I am saying. Look, all those people you see, he pointed along the street, are simply machines, nothing more. I think, you I, think I understand what you mean, I said, and I have often thought how little there is in the world that can stand against this form of mechanization and choose its own path. There is just, that is, <coughs> this is just where you make your greatest mistake, said G. You think there is something that chooses its own path something that can stand against mechanization. You think that not everything is equally mechanical. Why, of course not, I said. Art, poetry, thought are phenomena of quite a different order. Of exactly the same order, said G. These activities are just as mechanical as everything else. Men are machines, and nothing but mechanical actions can be expected of machines. Very well, I said. But, there, but are there no people who are not machines? It may be that there are, said G only not those people you see, and you do not know them. That is what I want you to, to understand. I thought it rather strange that he should be so insistent upon this point, that he, what he said seemed to me obvious and incontestable. At the same time, I had never liked such short and all-embracing metaphors. They always omitted points of difference. I, on the other hand, had always maintained differences were the most important thing, and that in order to understand things, it was first necessary to see the points in which they dif differed. So I felt that it was odd that G insisted on an idea which seemed to be obviously provided, seemed to be obvious, provided it were not made too absolute and exceptions were admitted. People are so unlike one another, I said, I do not think it would be possible to bring them all under the same heading. There are savages, there are mechanized people, there are intellectual people, there are geniuses. Quite right, said G. People are very unlike one another. But the real difference between people you do not know and cannot see. The difference of which you speak simply does not exist. This must be understood. All the people you see, all the people you know, all the people you may get to know, 
are machines, actual machines working solely under the power of external influences, as you yourself said. Machines they are born and machines they die. How do savages and intellectuals come into this? Even now, at this very moment while we are talking, several millions of machines are trying to anni annihilate one another. What is the difference between them? What are the, where are the savages and where are the intellectuals? They are all alike. But there is a possibility of ceasing to be a machine. It is of this we must think and not about the different kinds of machines that exist. Of course, there are different machines. A motor car is a machine, a gramophone is a machine, and a gun is a machine. But what of it? It is the same thing. They are all machines. Yes, uh, said G, in regard to the tarot, a great deal can be found by reading. For instance, take yourself, you might already know a great deal if you knew how to read. I mean that if you understood everything you have read in your life, you would already know what you are looking for now. If you understood everything you have written in your own book, what is it called? It's uh, Tertium Organum. I, sh I should come and bow down to you and beg you to teach me. But you do not understand either what you read or what you write. You do not even understand what the word understand means. Yet understanding is essential. And reading can be useful only if you understand what you read. But of course, no book can give real preparation. So it is impossible to say which is better. What a man knows well, he emphasized the word well, that is his preparation. If a man knows how to make coffee well or how to make boots well, then it is already possible to talk to him. The trouble is that nobody knows how, <clears throat> the trouble is that nobody knows anything well. Everything is known just anyhow, superficially. This was another one of those unexpected turns which G gave to his explanations. G's words, in addition to their ordinary meaning, undoubtedly contained another altogether different meaning. I had already be begun to realize that in order to arrive at this hidden meaning in G's words, one had to begin with their usual and simple meaning. G's words were always significant in their ordinary sense, although this was not the whole of their significance. The wider or deeper significance remained hidden for a long time. There is another talk which has remained in my memory. I asked G what a man had to do to assimilate this teaching. What to do? asked G as though surprised. It is impossible to do anything. A man must first of all understand certain things. He has, a thousand, he has thousands of false ideas and false conceptions, chiefly about himself, and he must get rid of some of them before beginning to acquire anything new. Otherwise, the new will be built on, a wrong, on the wrong foundation, and the result will be worse than before. How can one get rid of false ideas, I asked. We depend on the forms of our perception. False ideas are produced by the forms of our perception. G shook his head. Again, you speak of something different, he said. You speak of errors arising from perceptions, but I'm not speaking of these. Within the limits of given perceptions, man can err more or less. As I have said before, man's chief delusion is his conviction that he can do. All people think that they can do. All people want to do. And the first question all people ask is what they are to do. But actually, nobody does anything, and nobody can do anything. This is the first thing that must be understood. Everything happens. All that befalls a man, all that is done by him, all that comes from him, all happens. And it happens in exactly the same way. And it happens in exactly the same way as rain falls, as a result of a change in the temperature in the higher regions of the atmosphere or the surrounding clouds, as snow melts under the rays of the sun, as dust rises with the wind. No, oh, this is getting, this gets complex. Again, you speak of something different, he said. You speak of errors arising from perceptions, but I'm not speaking of these. Within the limits of given perceptions, man can err more or err less. As I have said before, man's chief delusion is his conviction that he can do. All people think they can do. All people want to do. And the first question all people ask is what they are to do. 
but actually nobody does anything, and nobody can do anything. This is the first thing that must be understood. Everything happens. All that, bef all that befalls a man, all that is done by him, all that comes from him, all this happens. And it happens in exactly the same way as rain falls as a result of a change in the temperature in the higher regions of the atmosphere or the surrounding clouds, as snow melts under the rays of the sun, as dust rises with the wind. Man is a machine. All his deeds, actions, words, thoughts, feelings, convictions, opinions, and habits are the results of external influences, external impressions. Out of himself a man cannot produce a single thought, a single action. Everything he says, does, thinks, feels, all this happens. Man cannot discover anything, invent anything. It all happens. To establish this fact for oneself, to understand it, to be convinced of its truth means getting rid of a thousand illusions about man, about his being creative, and consciously organizing his own life, and so on. There is nothing of this kind. Everything happens. Popular movements, wars, revolutions, changes of government, all this happens. And it happens in exactly the same way as everything happens in the life of individual man. Man is born, lives, dies, builds houses, writes books, not as he wants to, but as it happens. Everything happens. Man does not love, hate, desire. All this happens. But no one will ever believe you if you tell him he can do nothing. This is the most offensive and the most unpleasant thing you can tell people. It is particularly unpleasant and offensive because it is the truth, and nobody wants to know the truth. When you understand this, it will be easier for us to talk. But it is one thing to understand with a mind, and another thing to feel it with one, one's whole mass, to be really convinced that it is so, and never forget it. With this question of doing, G emphasized the word, Yet another thing is connected. It always seems to people that others invariably do things wrongly, not in the way they should be done. Everyone wants, everyone always thinks he could do it better. They do not understand and do not want to understand that what is being done, and particularly what has already been done in one way, cannot be and could not have been done in another way. Have you noticed how everyone now is talking about the war. Everyone has his own plan, his own theory. Everyone finds that nothing is being done in the way it ought to be done. Actually, everything is being done in the only way it can be done. If one thing could be different, everything could be different. And then perhaps there would have been no war. Try to understand what I'm saying. Everything is dependent on everything else. Everything is connected. Nothing is separate. Therefore, everything is going in the only way it can go. If people were different, everything would be different. They are what they are, so everything is, is as it is. This was very difficult to swallow. Is there nothing, absolutely nothing, that can be done, I asked? Absolutely nothing. And can nobody do anything? That is another question. In order to do, it is necessary to be. And it is necessary first to understand what to be means. If we continue our talks, you will see that we use a special language and that in order to talk with us, it is necessary to learn this language. It is not worthwhile talking in ordinary language because in that language it is impossible to understand one another. This also at the moment seems strange to you. But it is true. In order to understand, it is necessary to learn another language. In the language which people speak, they cannot understand one another. You will see later on why this is so. Then one must learn to speak the truth. This also appears strange to you. You do not realize that one has to learn to speak the truth. It seems to you that it is enough to wish or decide to do so. And I tell you that people comparatively rarely tell a deliberate lie. In most cases, they think they speak the truth 
and yet they lie all the time, both when they wish to lie and when they wish to speak the truth. They lie all the time, both to themselves and to others. Therefore nobody ever understands either himself or anyone else. Think, could there be such discord, such deep misunderstanding, and such hatred toward the views and opinions of others, if people were able to understand one another? But they cannot understand, because they cannot help lying. To speak the truth is the most difficult thing in the world, and one must study a great deal and for a long time in order to speak the truth. The wish alone is not enough. To speak the truth, one must know what the truth is and what a lie is, and first of all, in oneself. And this nobody wants to know. Okay, I have one, there's one more, <coughs> there's one more dialogue here. Of the last talks in Moscow, there is still another which remains in my memory, during which G said several things, which again became intelligible only subsequently. He was talking about a man I had met while with him, and he spoke of his relations with certain people. He is a weak man, said G. People take advantage of him, unconsciously, of course, and all because he considers them. If he did not consider them, everything would be different, and they themselves would be different. It seemed odd to me that a man should not consider others. What do you mean by the word consider, I asked. I both understand you and do not understand you. This word has a great many different meanings. Precisely the contrary, said G. There is only one meaning. Try to think about this. And let, me, let, me, let me read this again. He is a weak man, said G. People take advantage of him, unconsciously, of course, and all because he considers them. If he did not consider them, everything would be different, and they themselves would be different. Later on, I understood what G called considering and realized what an enormous place it occupies in life and how much it gives rise to. G called considering that attitude which creates inner slavery, inner, de inner dependence. Afterwards, we had occasion to speak a great deal about this. I remember another talk about the war. We were sitting in the Filipov's cafe on the Tverskaya. It was very full of people and very noisy. War and profiteering had created an unpleasant, feverish atmosphere. I had even refused to go there. G insisted, and as I was with him, I gave way. I had already realized by then that he, had s he sometimes purposely created difficult conditions for conversation, as though demanding of me some sort of extra effort and a readiness to reconcile myself to unpleasant and uncomfortable surroundings for the sake of talking to him. But this time the result was not particularly brilliant because owing to the noise, the most interesting part of what he was saying failed to reach me. At first I understood what G was saying, but the thread gradually began to slip away from me after several attempts to follow his remarks, of which only isolated words reached me. I gave up listening and simply observed how he spoke. The conversation began with my question, can war be stopped? And G answered, yes, it can. And yet I had been certain from previous talks that he would answer, no, it cannot. But the whole thing is how, he said. It is necessary to know a great deal in order to understand that. What is war? It is the result of planetary influences. Somewhere up there, two or three planets have approached too, new, too near to each other, 
tension results. Have you noticed how, if a man passes quite close to you on a narrow pavement, you become all tense? The same tension takes place between planets. For them it lasts, perhaps a second or two. But here on the Earth, people begin to slaughter one another, and they go on slaughtering maybe for several years. It seemed to them at the time that they hate one another, or perhaps that they have to slaughter each other for some exalted purpose, or that they must do that or that they must defend somebody or something, and that it is a very noble thing to do, or something else of the same kind. They fail to realize to what an extent they are mere pawns in the game. They think they signify something. They think they can move about as they like. They think they can decide to do this or that. But in reality, all their movements, all their actions, are the result of planetary influences, and they themselves signify literally nothing. Then the moon plays a big part in this, but we will speak about the moon separately. Only it must be understood that neither Emperor Wilhelm, that nor generals, nor ministers, nor parliaments signify anything or can do anything. Everything that happens on a big scale is governed from outside and governed either by accidental combinations of influences or by general cosmic laws. This was all I heard, only much later I understood what he wished to tell me, that is, how accidental influences could be diverted or transformed into something relatively harmless. It was really an interesting idea, referring to the esoteric meaning of sacrifices. Somewhere about this time, I was very much struck by a talk about the sun, the planets, and the moon. I do not remember how this talk began, but I remember that G drew a small diagram and tried to explain what he called the correlation of forces in different worlds. This was in connection with the previous talk, that is, in connection with the influences acting on humanity. The idea was roughly this. Humanity, or more correctly, organic life on Earth, is acted upon simultaneously by influences proceeding from various sources in different worlds. Influences from the planets, influences from the moon, influences from the sun, influences from the stars. All these influences act simultaneously. One influence predominates at one moment and another influence at another moment. And for man, there is a certain possibility of making a choice of influences. In other words, of passing from one influence to another. To explain how would need a very long talk, said G. So we will talk about this some other time. At this moment, I want you to understand one thing. It is impossible to become free from one influence without becoming subject to another. The whole thing, all work on oneself, consists in choosing the influence to which you wish to subject yourself and actually falling under this influence. And for this, it is necessary to know beforehand which influence is the more profitable. At this moment, I want you to understand one thing. It is impossible to become free from one influence without becoming subject to another. The whole thing, all work on oneself, consists in choosing the influence to which you, should, you wish to subject yourself and actually falling under this influence. And for this, it is necessary to know beforehand which influence is the more profitable. What, interest, what interested me in this talk was that G spoke of the planets and the moon as living beings having definite ages, a definite period of life, and possibilities of development and transition to other planes of being. From what he said, it appeared that the moon was not a dead planet, as it usually is usually accepted, but on the contrary, a planet in birth, a planet at the very initial stages of its development, which has not yet reached the degree of intelligence possessed by the Earth, as he expressed it. But the moon is growing and developing, said G and sometime it will possibly attain the same level as the Earth. Then, near it, a new moon will appear, and the Earth will become their sun. At one time, the, the sun was like the Earth, and the Earth like the moon, and earlier still, the sun was like the moon. This attracted my attention at once. Nothing had ever seemed to me more artificial, unreliable, and dogmatic than all the usual theories of the origin of planets and solar systems beginning with the Kant Laplace theory down to the very latest with all their additions and variations, the general public considers those theories, these theories, or at any rate the last one known to it, to be scientific and proven. But in fact, in actual fact, there is of course nothing less scientific and less proven than these theories. Therefore, the fact that G's system accepted an altogether different theory 
in organic theory having its origin in entirely new principles and showing a different universal order appeared to me very interesting and important. And in, and in what relation does the intelligence of the earth stand to the intelligence of the sun, I asked. The intelligence of the sun is divine, said G, but the earth can become the same. Only, of course, it is not guaranteed, and the earth may, may die, having attained nothing. Upon what does this depend, I asked. G's answer was very vague. There is a definite period, he said, for a certain thing to be done. If by a certain time what ought to be done has not been done, the earth may perish without having attained what it could have attained. Is this period known, I asked. It is known, said G. But it would be no but it would be no advantage whatever for people to know it. It would even be worse. Some would believe it, others would not believe it, yet others would demand proofs. Afterwards they would begin to to break one another's heads. Everything ends this way with people. Okay, that's three dialogues. Uh, three dialogues from uh, the first chapter of *In Search of the Miraculous* by P. D. Ospensky, the noted author, the noted author of *Tertium Organum*, combines the logic of a mathematician with a vision of a mystic in his quest for solutions to the problems of man and the universe. And uh, well, I don't really have much else to say at this point. This video is <coughs> copyrighted by Schoolhouse Productions, Schoolhouse Video, BAP, Bill Anderson Productions, ad infinitum. And uh, copies may be purchased from Bill Anderson, Post Office Box 23, West Rockport, 04865-0023, no telephone. You are seeing Walden Pond and other visuals from Concord, and of course, of course, uh, the elections for Dukakis and uh, Bush, and uh, what does it all mean? Oh boy! Oh boy! That's the meaning right there. <laughs> <laughs>